Well, good morning. And uh, we are continuing our journey through studying the Bible today uh, using the method of SOAP, Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. So we read Scripture, we observe it, we interpret it, we see how we apply it to our lives, and we pray about it. And uh, I release these Monday to Thursday every week. I release them on my Facebook page, on my YouTube channel, Anthony P. Richards, uh, on my Instagram account, uh, which is uh, AP Richards. And I try to get it out as many places as I can to share this so that people can have something just to uh, study along with the Bible and just maybe help you pull out some nuggets. That's one of the things that I love to do and just also just share uh, you know, to what, what I've discovered about God's Word. Today, uh, we're going to be uh, starting a journey through the book of Romans. And the book of Romans is a big book. It's slightly off schedule for today. Uh, but I wanted to do that because it's, it's not a book I want to rush through. Uh, it's an incredibly unique book in the Bible. It has been described by theologians as the Himalayas of the Bible. The Himalayas is the largest and tallest mountain range in the world, uh, contains the highest peaks where Mount Everest is, and that's, that's how theologians put the truth that is contained in the book of Romans. Uh, it contains the highest peak of revelation of God. Uh, it's a really amazing book, and it's certainly not something that you can rush through. It's a very difficult book. It's not an easy book. Uh, the Apostle Peter even, you know, he mentioned this in Second Peter chapter 3. He said, Also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, in which are some things hard to understand. The book of Romans has a lot of life-changing truth. And you, you have to approach the book of Romans uh, with a determination. You have, you have to go into it knowing that you're going to have to put effort in to understand it. And you have, to, uh, you have to put that effort in to understand what the Holy Spirit was saying through the Apostle Paul. Uh, the writing date of the book of Romans is, is somewhere between 53 and 58 AD. So this is after Paul has been in ministry for probably about 20 years. Uh, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He has three months in Corinth uh, without anything going on. Uh, he, he, he maybe thought this was a good time to write ahead to the Christians in Rome, which was a place that he planned to visit uh, after his trip to Jerusalem. Now, as he was endeavoring to go to Rome, the Holy Spirit warns him about the peril that's awaiting him in Jerusalem. You can read about that in Acts 20, 20, 21, where the Holy Spirit kind of says to, to Paul, well, what if you're unable to make it? Then you, you, you must write a letter. He, he, he basically realizes, well, if I don't make it to Rome ever, I have to write them a letter so comprehensive that the Christians in Rome will have the gospel preached to them as if I was there. And it's interesting because the other New Testament letters focus more on the church and the challenges and the problems of the church and within the church. But the letter to Romans focuses very clearly and solely on God. It is a book about God and God's redemption and God's plan through salvation. It, it has some very deep truths. It also has some very blunt and straightforward and almost harsh passages of scripture if they're read in context of our culture today. So I'm going to do my best to just share with you in love what this book is and uh, what it's all about. We're going to start today with Romans chapter 1. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Paul's self-identification is very important. He says, firstly, I'm a servant, and secondly, I'm called to be an apostle. And the idea of being an apostle or being called to one is that you are a special ambassador and messenger. And this is something that William Clark said. This is what separated uh, Paul uh, unto the gospel. St. Paul may here refer to his former state as a Pharisee, which literally signifies a separatist or one who is separated. Before he was separated unto the service of his own sect, now he is separated to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of God. 
So what is the gospel of God? Well, well, it's interesting that he starts off the book of Romans with this because the word God actually appears 153 times in the book of Romans, more frequently than any other New Testament book. So Paul here in the very first verse is saying this whole book is going to be about God, the gospel of God, the good news of God. Verse 2, which he, God, promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul's saying, this is not new. I, I, this is not a clever invention of mine. This is something that is a very actual old plan revealed by the prophets hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Who is this about? It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. The center of Christianity is not a teaching or a moral system. The center of Christianity is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Jesus has both human origin, he was born of the seed of David, and he has an eternal existence. He's declared to be the Son of God. And the evidence of Jesus' humanity is in his birth. The evidence of his deity is in his resurrection from the dead. And Paul also says here that he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's a very important statement here. It, it, it's very important that Jesus, uh, sorry, that Paul gave Jesus his full title, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In fact, one of the most uh, memorable things for me, the first time I went to, to Israel, was uh, some Palestinian Christians that I met in Bethlehem. And they never referred to Jesus or Jesus Christ. Every time they would talk about him, they would say, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the birthplace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is where Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, was, was born. And uh, it's a great reverence. And that's what Paul is establishing here. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he's declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Paul's gospel was a gospel that was going to impact individual lives. It's not an interesting theory. Uh, it's not an interesting philosophy. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's life-changing good news. And the gospel gave Paul and the church grace and apostleship. And one reason those two gifts were given was to then produce obedience and faith. Uh, William Clark said, Without the grace, favor, and peculiar help of God, he could not have been an apostle in the first place. The, see, the gospel had reached Roman Christians, which meant that they had already demonstrated that they were called of Jesus Christ, meaning that they were uh, recipients, invitees of, uh, they were invited to receive the gospel message and they had chosen to receive it. And this is what Paul's saying. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting, because Paul had actually never been to Rome. And he didn't even, he wasn't the founder of the Roman church. And that's what makes the book of Romans different, because most of Paul's letters are written to churches that he actually founded. And it seems like the, the church in Rome began spontaneously as Christians came to the city and settled there. Acts chapter 2 verse 10, the day of Pentecost uh, there were people from Rome amongst the Jewish people there. They were present there. And then when they returned home to Rome, they, they immediately started a Christian community of spirit-filled, tongue-speaking Christians in, in Rome. And what's interesting is that even though Paul had never been there, through uh, mutual acquaintances, uh, through his many travels, he knew a lot of the Christians in Rome by name. He actually mentions them in Romans 16. And even if Paul only knew of them by acquaintance, he knew two things about the Christians in Rome. He knew that they were the beloved of God and that they were saints. And that's why he says, grace to you and peace from God. So he formally addresses them with his very 
familiar greeting, which has combines two concepts. One, it's uh, combining the Greek greeting of grace with the Jewish greeting of peace. And it's also adding to the traditional greeting of the uh, entire region, which was centered on peace. And Paul's understanding that without the grace of God, you can't have the peace of God. God's gracious gift is what allows you to have God's peace. And that's why Paul always said grace and peace. Okay, let's move on. Verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Uh, They had to have strong faith because being a Christian in Rome was incredibly unpopular. In fact, they were written of as enemies of the human race. That's what people in Rome wrote about them. And then Paul says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you uh, always in my prayers. Uh, Paul's acknowledgement here is that it's easy to tell somebody you're going to pray for them, but he's saying, no, 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 I want you to know God is my witness means I actually really did pray for you. Making request, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Paul's desire to visit the church in Rome was not merely to just give something to them, but it was to receive something from them as well. Because Paul realized that they shared a mutual faith, that means that they had something to give him. We always have something to give and receive from other Christ followers. This is what Paul is establishing here. Verse 13. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but I was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you, just as among other Gentiles. So he wanted them to know, look, uh, I've tried to get there, but I just haven't been able to. Now, perhaps there were enemies of Paul, that implied that he was afraid to go to Rome. Maybe they were like, oh man, maybe you're not ready to go to to the big city of Rome and preach there, are you? Uh, He was was like, no, 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 I I know I need to go there to produce fruit of my ministry. Then he goes on to say, I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. Paul recognized that he had a debt to Rome itself. The Roman Empire had brought world peace. They brought order. They brought a common uh, cultural, uh, excellent uh, transportation, uh, common cultural system, an excellent transportation system to the world. And Paul used everything that the Romans established. He used those for the further furtherment of the gospel, for spreading the gospel, so that he could best repay this debt by giving Rome the good news of Jesus Christ. So. As much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Uh, this this is, uh, three, contains three words, verse 15, that really encapsulate the Apostle Paul in totality. I am ready. Charles Spurgeon wondered if Paul didn't use the words I am ready as his motto, like if he would have, if he would have told somebody this is who I am. Because almost the first words out of his mouth when he was saved in Acts 9 were, Lord, what do you want me to do? (laughs) Uh, Paul was ready to preach the gospel and to serve. He was ready to suffer in Acts 21. He was ready to do the unpleasant work in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And he was ready to die in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, Ironically, in the mystery of God's irony, when Paul eventually goes to Rome, He actually goes as a shipwrecked prisoner. Uh, Spurgeon said this, When our hearts are set on a thing and we are ready for it and we pray for it, God may grant us the blessing, but it may be in a way that we never looked for. You shall go to Rome, Paul, but you will go in chains. So he said, I'm ready to, to preach the gospel in Rome. He didn't know he was going to go in chains on a ship. He had no idea. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. This is Paul's thesis. This is his, his statement for his letter to Romans. Is this, it's, it's encapsulated. 
in this incredibly sophisticated city like Rome, some people might be embarrassed by a gospel that centered on a crucified Jewish savior. Uh, and it was embraced by the lowest classes of people. But Paul said, I am not ashamed. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? For it is the power of God. That's why he's not ashamed, because it's centered on a crucified Savior who has inherent power. See, Paul understood the power of salvation, the power of God through salvation. Paul, Paul does not say that the gospel brings power. He says that it is power and it's God's power. See, the city of Rome, they thought they knew all about power. They, they thought they were all that. But they, they were powerless to make themselves right before God. And it's interesting because the word salvation in Rome was actually a common word. We don't talk about salvation much apart now. It's become like a church word, salvation. It's not really. It's a Bible word. But we, it's a Bible word only talked about uh, in, the, in the concept of salvation uh, through Christ. But it was a word often used in Roman culture. Uh, there were philosophers who... Uh, you know, knew that that mankind was sick and needed help. Uh, uh, Epictetus called his lecture room the hospital for the sick soul. Epicurus called his teaching the medicine of salvation. And the gospel's power to salvation comes to who? Everybody who believes. Everybody. God will not withhold salvation from anybody who believes. Believing is the requirement, and that is going to be explained through the book of Romans. Uh, now, why did he say for the Jew first and then the Greek? That was the pattern of the spread of the gospel. It didn't mean it was more important for Jews than it was for Greeks, and it wasn't about Greeks as a race. It was people who thought like Greek people. And that you can read about that's demonstrated in the ministry of Jesus. You can read about that in Matthew 15. And also the initial ministry calling of the disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Now, uh, what is it for? For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So simply this, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. This, this revelation of God's righteousness comes to those with faith which is a fulfillment of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by faith. And it's essential to understand exactly what the righteousness of, of God revealed by the gospel actually is. It doesn't speak of the holy righteousness of God that condemns the guilty sinner, but of the God kind of righteousness that is given to the sinner who puts their trust in Jesus Christ. And, and the, the ancient word here used for righteousness means to justify. It means that God treats the sinner just as if he had not been a sinner at all. And this declaration is even greater when we understand that this is the righteousness of God given to every believer. All you need to do is believe. It's not a righteousness of even the most holy person, nor is it, is it the righteousness of Adam and Eve. It's God's righteousness. And this faith and trust in Jesus Christ becomes the basis of life for those who are justified uh, and who are truly the just living by faith. They're not only saved by faith, they're, they're living by faith. You and I are not just saved by faith, we're living by it every day. And not only from faith, but from faith to faith. What is that? That can seem like a difficult phrase to wrap our heads around. But when you think about it, from faith to faith, it just means your, your relationship with Jesus starts with faith. Your daily walk continues in faith and your eternity is in faith. Your journey with Jesus through God is rooted in faith, grounded in faith, and it abounds in faith. The whole journey is from faith to faith. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. The idea is simple but sobering. God's wrath, which is what Paul is about to go and talk about 
in the rest of Romans 1, after revealing his thesis, after revealing the power of salvation, he's going to talk about what salvation means. See, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against the human race. And the human race deserves the wrath of God. And we sometimes object to this whole concept of the wrath of God because we equate it with human wrath, human anger, which is motivated by selfish personal reasons or a desire for revenge. We must never forget that the wrath of God is completely righteous in character. Andrew Murray said this, Wrath is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of his holiness. In Romans verse 16, Paul spoke of salvation. But what are we saved from? This is what he's talking about. First and foremost, we're saved from the wrath of God that we righteously deserve. That's what he's talking about. And he says, now, who's this going to be a problem for? It's going to be a problem for those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. See, we do in fact suppress the truth of God. Every truth revealed to mankind by God has been fought against, disregarded, and deliberately obscured and covered over by man at some time. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God shows us something of his eternal power and his divine nature through creation by the things that are made. He's given us a general revelation that is obvious both in creation and within the mind and the hearts of men. And it's clearly seen. See, the universal character of this revelation and the clarity of it leave us without any excuse for rejecting it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's, let's go on here. Uh, verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. The problem is not that man did not know God. It's that he did know him, but he refused to glorify him as God. Therefore, we are without excuse. See, instead of glorifying God, we transformed our idea of him into forms and images that were, we were more comfortable with as, a, as, as mankind. And our minds are corrupt. Our hearts are darkened. And, and so it's... It's absolutely essential that we constantly compare who we think God is against the reality of who he is as revealed in his word. Because otherwise we can end up being guilty of worshipping a God that we've made up in our own minds and hearts. That's when people say things like, well, I can't imagine a God who would do this. Or I can't imagine a God who would say that. Well, now you've created a God that's not the God of the Bible. So you've now created a false image. And that's tough because we often say those things out of noble love. But Paul's going to address all this. And, and many of it he's, he's about to address in the verses we're about to read. Because they were, verse 22, they were professing to be wise, but they became fools. Now, earlier on that, he talked about how mankind was, was not thankful. Uh, Spurgeon said this, he said, I cannot say anything much worse of a man than that he is not thankful to those who have been his benefactors. And when you say that he is not thankful to God, you have said about the worst thing you can say about him. Now, our rejection of God's general revelation doesn't make us smarter. It doesn't make us better. What it makes us is futile in our thoughts and makes our foolish hearts darkened and we become fools. David Guzik said this, the fact is once somebody rejects the truth of God in Jesus, 
they will now fall for anything foolish and trust far more feeble and fanciful systems than what they have rejected from God. Okay, Paul then goes on to say, verse 23, And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, actually, uh, before I go on to that, um, this image, the word image in Romans one twenty three is the ancient Greek word icon, uh, E-I-K-O-N. And it's a dangerous thing to change the glory of the incorruptible God into an icon or an image of your own choosing or my own choosing. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. This is about to get really deep. Okay, we are going to dive really deep here in the next few verses because this is the depth of God's wrath that salvation is designed to save us from. In God's righteous wrath and judgment, God gives man up to the sin that our evil hearts desire. He allows us to experience the self-destructive result of sin. And this phrase is so important that Paul repeats it three times in this passage. Uh, Hosea 4.17 expresses the judgmental aspect of God giving us up, leaving us to our own sin. The the quote from uh, Hosea 4.17, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. See, we make a mistake when we think that it's God's mercy or kindness that allows us to continue in our sin. Uh, We take that as meaning that God's giving us permission to live in the sin. It is actually his wrath that allows us to go on destroying ourselves with sin. Verse 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. In every rebellion and disobedience against God, we end up exchanging the truth of God for the lie of our own choosing. And we set the creature before the creator. In other words, we, we set what, what man thinks is right above that who created man said is right. And Paul uses the definite article here. He doesn't say it's a lie. He says it's the lie. The lie is idolatry. That's what puts us in place of God. It, it's the same lie that the devil said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, the Garden of Eden, if you eat this, you will be like God. Okay? The devil has never stopped trying to use the same lie. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now, Paul wrote this from the city of Corinth, where every sort of sexual immorality and ritualistic prostitution was practiced totally freely. And the terminology in uh, verse 24 refers to the combination of sexual immorality with uh, idolatrous worship. Uh, Now, interestingly enough, Charles Spurgeon thought that this part of Romans chapter 1 was unfit for public reading. In other words, he didn't want to read this publicly in a sermon. He said this, The first chapter of the epistle to Romans is a dreadful portion of the word of God. I should hardly like to read it aloud all through. Read it at home and be startled at the awful vices of the Gentile word. And and I understand why he said that. Uh, Because Paul is going to use homosexuality here, both in female and male expressions, 
as an example of God giving mankind over to uncleanness and lust. Now, sometimes people say in the Bible it doesn't condemn lesbian homosexuality, but the likewise, the word likewise in, in Romans one twenty seven makes it clear that the sin of homosexuality condemned in Romans one twenty seven is connected to the sin of women mentioned in Romans one twenty six. Now, Paul doesn't even use the normal words here for men and women. He uses the words male and female. He's using categories to describe sexuality outside of human terms because the type of sexual sin that he's describing in, in his description is outside of human dignity. And Paul categorizes the whole section under the idea of vile passions, unhealthy, unholy. Nevertheless, Paul lived in a culture that openly approved of homosexuality. Paul didn't write this to a culture that agreed with him. Paul wrote this to a culture where homosexuality was accepted as a part of life for both men and women. For over 200 years, the, the, the men who had ruled the Roman Empire openly practiced homosexuality, often with young boys. Uh, at times, the Roman Empire even taxed approved homosexual prostitution and they gave boy prostitutes a legal holiday. Uh, legal marriage between same gender couples was recognized. And even some of the emperors married other men. At the very time that Paul wrote this, Nero was the emperor and he took a boy by the name of Sporos and had him castrated and then he married him. They had a full wedding ceremony and then he brought him to the palace with a whole great procession, like he wasn't trying to hide it. And he made this young boy his wife. Later, when Nero discarded this young boy, he then took another uh, husband this time, and then Nero lived as the wife. In, in modern culture, homosexual practice reflects in this scripture the abandonment of giving them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Um, and, and, and I know that this is, this, is, this is why it's tough to read this, because this is the truth. This is, what, this, is, this is why Paul wrote this, because he knew that if you did that, you would receive in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. Paul speaks of a penalty for homosexual conduct. Um, and it speaks of the generally self-destructive nature of sin. And often sin carries with itself its own penalty. Sometimes it's the sin, uh, the, the penalty of rebellion. It's, it results in a spiritual emptiness and, and, and everything that goes along with that. Uh, and, and what we have to understand from Paul's writings here is that this Freedom to disobey, that is God's judgment. God's judgment is giving you the freedom to disobey. It's not his kindness that's giving you the freedom to disobey. And those who engage in such acts are receiving in themselves the penalty of their error. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. As further judgment, God gives man over to a debased mind so that things that are disgraceful and sickening are readily accepted and approved. And the word debased here originally meant that which has not stood the test. A debased mind is about our rebellion against God and it's not only being displayed in our actions, it's displayed in our thinking, where we are basically genuinely spiritually insane in our rebellion against God. Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. This list, 
gives us concrete examples of the kinds of things which are not fitting. And it's interesting how we can see that there are socially acceptable sins, such as covetousness and envy and pride, uh, that are included alongside socially unacceptable sins, such as murder uh, or being unloving. And, uh, you know, covetousness, which is just having, you know, that itch for more, you know, you, whatever you've got is never enough. Um, he talks about whisperers. I love that when he talks about whisperers. Uh, William Clark said they are secret detractors who under pretended secrecy carry about the accusations against their neighbours, whether true or false, blasting their reputation by clandestine tittle-tattle. Envy. Envy is, is a much bigger sin than we understand. Uh, envy is so powerful that there's a sense in which it was actually the sin that put Jesus on the cross. Because Pilate knew in Matthew 27, he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Verse 32. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. See, those who practice these things or approve of those who practice them are worthy of death. That's a very strong statement. They are worthy targets of the wrath of God. So where does all this violence, immorality, cruelty, degradation come from? It happens when mankind abandons the true knowledge of God. And, and the state of society reflects God's judgment upon mankind for this. This is why... All of this is why Paul said in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation for everyone who believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is Paul saying we need to be saved from the wrath of God. This is an, and it's the power of our salvation. But we need to be saved because if we live like this, we're not uh, I, I can totally understand Charles Spurgeon's feelings on this chapter. Um, and, and, and in some ways, I wish I didn't have to do it. Because, but, I, but I do it because I love Jesus and I love people. And I don't want to not tell people about something that could separate them from Jesus and his word. And, and on, on, on the struggle of homosexuality, let me just say this. If this is a struggle for you or somebody you know, then there is a, there's, there's a part of me that I acknowledge, I understand it's not easy for you. I understand it's not e easy for people to struggle with these internal feelings. But I don't want to encourage people to stay where they are. I want to encourage people to reach out to God and allow him to do something they maybe think he can't do. Otherwise, Ephesians 3 verse 20 is, is an irrelevant verse. Ephesians 3 verse 20, Paul wrote in the, to the church of Ephesus, Now to God, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And amen. See, God can do more than we can ask or think. So whatever, so if you, if you say, well, I just can't imagine that God could do this, or I can't imagine that God would do that. Listen, God is not limited to what you can imagine he can or can't do. If he was, he would not be God, you would be. And, and, and we would all be in trouble if you're God or I'm God. So let's, let's stand and understand that, that the, the message of salvation is about God sending his son, God, to protect us from the wrath of God. Do you understand? God sent himself to protect us from himself. Why did he do that? Because the wrath of God is something that is righteous. It's just. But Jesus came to save us from that. Does that mean we're going to have trouble in this time? Yes, it does. Does that mean that we're going to have internal struggles maybe for every day we're on this planet? Yes, it does. But there is an opportunity for us to spend an eternity with Jesus Christ because of the gospel message that Paul is writing to the church in Rome. 
Heavenly Father, so much in this today. Help us uh, to, to process this and to establish, Lord, the, the truths of this in, in, in our hearts in love. God, help us to understand that you love every one of us. We are all sinners saved by grace. All have fallen short. All have sinned. And we all need salvation to save us from the wrath of God. In your name we pray. Amen.